Hello and welcome to another boat maintenance vlog. This one is about servicing a Johnson Evinrude 1997 two-stroke 15 horsepower outboard engine. The engine actually came with the boat when we bought it and was already well over 20 years old uh, and it wasn't in the best of health. So the first service was in Malta with a guy called Hugo who was the two-stroke guru on the island and he gave me a complete dress down on the state it was in um, and even though I felt it wasn't my fault, I did learn a lot from him. Always the engine must be slow speed to shift the gear. Yeah. All right? Yeah. All right. So four years on, uh, it's in a lot better state than it was in. Obviously, it's still not in its first flush of youth, um, but it's still the main engine we use for our AB dinghy. So the first thing I had to do was knock up a stand for it because there was actually nowhere to hang it off to service it and I didn't want to do it on the side of the boat for obvious reasons. So before servicing it and winterizing it, there were a few problems that I had to sort out first. So today I need to winterize the two-stroke, the Evinrude 15 horsepower. There was a, a fuel leak coming from the carburetor somewhere the cowling trim was also coming away. The telltales weren't actually producing any water, so there was no flow of cooling water going through the engine. And also one of the clamp lugs had uh, basically crumbled under the UV light. Um, it's an old engine, it's a 1997. Um, but it's been fairly reliable up to now. It's been a little bit intermittent, but um, this season we've had a few problems with it. The cooling water's not coming out. So I've tried cleaning the, uh, the nozzle here. Um, that sometimes gets clogs up with uh, salt crystals. So first I took the end cap off and just poked it through with a wire to dislodge any salt crystals that might have been there. Then I made sure that the outlet hose was clear, which it was. Then I gave the intakes a good spray through with a high pressure hose. But even then I was getting nothing through, so obviously the blockage or whatever it was, was inside the leg. So the outlet is, is here, um, and that's all clear. The tube's all clear. And this is the inlet here, and that's all clear. So there's no seaweed or salt crystals in there. So the flushing kit is basically an adapter that fits onto the flushing inlet. All it is, is an adapter in which you can fit on a hose to flush the engine through. Now, that costs 60 or 70 euros, which is ridiculous. I don't know why these companies try and rip off existing customers this way. It's only, a, it's just a little bit of pipe. Um, so I wasn't gonna pay that. So instead, I poured some hot water through the flushing inlet in the hope that it would dissolve any salt crystals. But that's not working. So I think what I'm gonna have to try and do now is put some earmuffs on and force some water through into the impeller down the bottom and hopefully that'll clear whatever crud is in there. Um, I'm kind of hoping that the impeller isn't damaged because I've got to take the whole leg off to replace that. So that did the job. Most of the cooling water actually comes out through the exhaust, which is in the middle of the propeller. Uh, and that was nice and warm, so clearly it was actually cooling the power head. So next up was changing the gearbox oil. A little bit of a stiff uh, outlet plug here. The tip of the plug is magnetic, so it actually attracts any fragments of metal. There's a few grainy bits in there. That is pretty filthy. It's black and it's uh, felt grainy as well, so there's obviously tiny bits of metal in there. So it's definitely time for an oil change. I'll just undo the top screw as well, just to help it on its way. A bit of air in the top. So I'm just going to pump a little bit of oil through there just to clear out the gook. And then I'll start filling it up from the bottom. So it's already running through clear. That's good. The reason I like these bottles is they've got their own thread on the bottom so you can actually screw it into the intake. And the reason you do it from the bottom up and not from the top down is so you blow all the air bubbles up because if you do it from the top there's a chance that the air bubbles could get trapped and then you won't know until you run it and then suddenly you haven't got enough oil in your gearbox. You pump away, I think this takes about 290 millilitres 
and you know when it's full because it will come out the top. And it's good just to turn the prop every now and again just to make sure that there are no air bubbles getting trapped. Yeah. So it's running out the top now. And that looks about right. It's about a third. Another tricky bit, getting this out and putting the plug back in. Quite at the right angle. From the bottom plug. So that was the gearbox oil changed. Next job, fitting the rubber cowling rim. So I just removed the whole thing in the end, give it a good sand down and then glued it back on with some rubber adhesive. And that was another job ticked off the list. So to get to the carburetor, I had to take off the pull cord and the air intake filter. We've also got a fuel leak um, just down by the carburetor, which is really difficult to get to. So um, I'm having to take the pull cord off um, to get to it. You can see the manufacturing date on the, uh, on the engine itself. This is the air filter because that leads into the carburetor there. Yeah, so there's the choke. So you can see how it cuts off the airflow to make a fuel rich mixture. And once they were out of the way, I didn't even have to investigate any further because I could see the leak was coming from the fuel hose leading into the carburetor. So luckily the leak was right at the end so all I needed to do was cut off about half an inch and reinstate the pipe and it was good as new. A quick check of the fuel filter. So we're just checking there, make sure the filter's okay. So as the pull cord and the air filter had been already removed, I could easily access the carburetor. So it's a carburetor there. So I need to get it off here and here. It's a bit fiddly. Although when I repaired the fuel line, I'd attach it back on with a cable tie. So I needed to cut that back off to get the carburetor out. So I took it to my temporary workshop in the cockpit and took it apart and gave it a thorough clean. One last one. So I'm just going to remove that bowl now. Careful not to damage the gasket. And there's the float. It looks remarkably clean. in there. Float switch is fine. What I need to do now is test the feed and fuel. So these rolls are incredibly delicate and fiddly. You would be careful not to damage this. So I need to push this pin out and take the float off. So I'm just going to take this uh, pin that's holding the float switch in place. It's very delicate so you've just got a bit of wire just to poke it through. So the pin seems to be okay. And what that does is it regulates the fuel going in there. I need to take this out just to check it. So that's clear. That's good. So that's fairly clear. So Basically the fuel comes in here, 
and is regulated by that pin and the float switch which fills the reservoir and then the fuel gets taken up here and then eventually into the end into the uh, cylinder so I'm just checking that that line is clear and it is because I can see you'll be really careful with using wire but there's nothing blocking that so that's fine That's fine as well. So I'm going to take the top of the carburetor off now. Um, these are numbered, and I presume that's how you're supposed to take them on and off to stop any sort of twisting or warping. But obviously, at some point, bear in mind this is a second-hand engine. At some point, this one's been changed. So we've got a flathead there and crossheads here. One of my pet hates that. Loosen them all evenly first. So it's one, two, three, four, five, and six. Just be careful not to damage this throttle bit because it's, it's a very delicate bit of plastic on there. That's the throttle cable there, so you can see how it lets the air in and out with the gasket. Be very careful not to break it. So that all looks pretty clean, so I think I'll just give it a spray through with some fogging spray. I can't actually get into the internal bit there. I'll just give it a spray with some fogging spray. Oh, sh so rule number one when you're cleaning out your carburetor, don't keep your fogging spray next to your adhesive because I picked up the wrong can and I just sprayed adhesive into the jets and so I've spent the last two hours running around trying to find somebody with a, um, an air gun to clean the jets. So I've basically washed through acetone to clear the adhesive out and blow it out through with compressed air. So luckily it's clear now, but... Ugh. So basically what it was a 20 minute job has turned out to be a two hour job and I still haven't finished it. Don't spray adhesive into your carburetor. So that's the carburetor cleaned out now, so I'm going to put it back on the engine. Well, this isn't the best solution, but I haven't got any sir clips, so I just have to make do really. So I put it back in place and then replaced the air intake filter and the pull cord. If you feel like taking the carburetor apart is a bit of an overkill, then um, the best thing to do is to remove the fuel line as the engine's running and then spray fogging spray into the air intake and that will circulate the protective oil inside the cylinder as the engine's running dry. And that means you haven't got any fuel oil residue inside the carburetor while the outboard is out of service. Spark plugs next and I've always had a bit of a problem with spark plugs because they always end up clogging with oil from the from the fuel oil mixture. So it's an old engine, around about 25 years old now, um, and it's well worked in. So I've reduced the oil to fuel mixture from 50 to 1 to 100 to 1, uh, and that seems to have lessened the clogging of the spark plugs. A bit of fogging spray helps to preserve it over the storage period. And also in the chamber, as you pull the pull cord, it makes the fogging spray get well inside the chamber.
Next up was replacing the camp screw lug. One of them had broken off and basically disintegrated under the UV light. The thread itself was fine, it was just the lug that needed replacing. That one is probably quite brittle as well. So we've got some new ones here. We got this sent out from the UK because to get them made up here was going to cost 18 euros. And these were about, know, about 20 euros I think. So I'm not quite sure how these stay in because they just kind of slide in and then slide back out again. I don't know if you're supposed to kind of hammer the ends to fatten them out. It seems to be what's happened to the old ones here. But I'm just a bit scared in case I miss it and crack the, the key. Bit WD 40 on it. Well, so we should have done the trick. So a bit of lube and they were as good as new. So I also pumped grease into the grease nipples and that was the engine ready for storage until next season. So here we are three years later in Martinique, uh, sorry, no, where we are now. Three years later in Curacao in the Dutch Antilles. Um, and we've been having problems with the kill switch. The kill cord is coming out, but the kill switch isn't killing the engine, which is obviously dangerous. So I'm going to replace that. So um, we're now in Colombia. Uh, uh, due to the, uh, the powers of editing, I can kind of jump ahead a few months. Since then we've been back to the UK and when I was back in the UK uh, I ordered a, a new kill switch um, which I put in the, the model and make number of the outboard and stupidly I didn't take it out of the box until we were back on the boat. Um, and when I've tried it against the original kill switch it's nothing like it, basically it doesn't fit. So now I'm stuck in a situation where I'm going to have to try and solder the old one back on here but the, the wires because they're quite degraded I've had to cut them back quite away to get to some decent wire and they're now too short so I found some bits of wire here which are almost the same gauge they're slightly bigger so it's just better than being slightly smaller and I'm going to attempt to um, solder that the old switch back on um, I did test it with the uh, multimeter and the kill switch seemed to be actually fine but I think it was just the wires that were um, just uh, giving a bit of a, a bad signal, which is why it wasn't cutting off. So uh, I'm going to do that now. I'm just going to solder the old one back on. Next time, make sure that I check before I put boxes in cases and bring them halfway across the world, only to discover the, the, the wrong thing. So just put in a bit of rosin on there, solder them together, and then put some shrink wrap on. Okay, so they're not the prettiest uh, of soldering joints I've ever done. That's a really tricky place to get into, um, but they should hold. I'm going to put some shrink wrap on now. So next thing to do is just cut those wires back. So you can see they're quite corroded, quite deep down. Just tested it with the multimeter just to check that we have got a continuity. Go through there and that the kill switch does actually stop that. So everything checks out. I've put it all back together, I've all checked it out, it looks great. And then suddenly I've realised I haven't put the nylon nut on the back of the kill switch. So now I have to basically cut that open, put that back on, and then redo the whole soldering. Good job, I left plenty of um, spare on the line. So, having uh, fixed the nylon nut on this time, 
I think we're ready to uh, put it all back in place. I'll still try and find a new kill switch at some point, um, but I'm hoping this will keep us going until then. Okay, ready for a try. So that was that. This 25 year old engine keeps chugging away and it's the main workhorse on our AB dinghy. And hopefully after checking the budget, uh, it has a lot more years left in it yet. That's it on servicing this two stroke, 15 horsepower engine. Hope you enjoyed it and uh, please stay tuned for the next video. So thanks for watching and a special thank you to our patrons who keep us going through good times and bad. If you found this blog useful and you're the type of person who likes to return a favor, then you can buy me a beer by following the links to PayPal or Patreon in the description below. And now you can also buy one of our crew shirts by following the links to our merch store. 